Happy New Year, everybody. Join me tonight on Twitch at 11.30 p.m. Eastern at the conclusion of Sunday Night Football, where we'll celebrate the new year, talk all things Week 17, and talk all things Jaguars in their game against the Texans. Link to join below. And now, on with our feature presentation. I'm just going to ask you a very basic question straight up that shouldn't be a trick at all. Let's say you're determining what team wins the division by looking at the standings. Two teams are playing each other on the final week of the season. One of the teams has 10 wins. The other team has 7 wins. They've both played the same number of games. They both played the exact same number of weeks. And this is the final game of the season for both of these teams. On the surface, if I asked you what this game means in terms of determining who wins the division, what would you say? You would say that it means absolutely nothing. The team with 10 wins has already clinched it by that point. And even if they lose, since that team has 10 wins and the other team would now have 8, the game doesn't mean anything for determining who wins the division and who gets to go to the playoffs. In a normal world, this is how it should work. In a normal world, this is common sense. The team that has more wins gets the playoff spot. However, as you could probably tell by now, this is not a normal world. If it was, then there would be no point in making this video. Because this team that you've been watching this whole time right here is the 1963 New York Giants. And in a completely normal situation, they would have clinched a playoff spot, a conference title, and a spot in the NFL Championship well before the final week of the season. But because of how absolutely backwards and messed up the entire system was back then, they were playing a winner-take-all game on the final week of the season that, quite frankly, never should have been a winner-take-all game. Because this is the story behind what might just be the stupidest playoff scenario and the stupidest playoff tiebreaker in NFL history. Before I talk about the actual situation in question, we need some context to understand the two teams fighting for this Eastern Conference title. The year is 1963, and remember that back then, only the winner of each conference based on the best record made it to the playoffs, which in this case was a one-game NFL championship. There were no wild cards or anything like that. If you did not win your conference, you were out. And while sometimes the system can lead to an incredibly boring final week if the conferences are wrapped up and there's nothing to play for, entering the final week of the 1963 season, that was far from the truth. In the Western Conference, it came down to the final week of the season between the Chicago Bears and the Green Bay Packers, and you can learn more about the bizarre scenario involved there by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But in the Eastern Conference, there were still two teams alive fighting for a shot in the NFL Championship. In one corner, you have the team that you've been watching this whole time, the New York Football Giants. When watching them play, it was actually very easy to understand why they were so good, and why they were atop the conference. They had the best offense in all of football, and quite honestly, there was no close second. Through the first 13 games, the Giants had scored 415 points, averaging just under 32 points per game. For some perspective, the next closest team was the Green Bay Packers, who had 348 points, or a full 67 points less than the Giants. And the closest team in the Eastern Conference was the St. Louis Cardinals, who had 317 points, roughly 100 points worse. The Giants had made it to the NFL Championship in each of the past two seasons under head coach Ali Sherman, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And led by the great play of Y.A. Tittle, the MVP of the league and their star quarterback, who led the league in passing touchdowns by throwing 36 of them at the age of 37, showing no signs of slowing down whatsoever, they were looking to make it a three-peat, because entering the final week of the season, the Giants had 10 wins. And in the other corner, you had this team right here, the Pittsburgh Steelers. For the last six years under head coach Buddy Parker, the Steelers were hovering right around the middle of the pack. Never bad, but never really great or competing for a conference title. Heck, even in 1962, when they went 9-5 and five and set a franchise record for most wins in a season, they were still three games back of the Giants for the conference title, and allowed more points than they scored. But in 1963, 
things felt different. Because over the course of the last eight weeks of the season, entering the final week of the year, the Steelers somehow emerged as one of the hottest teams in football, having lost just once in that stretch. They weren't doing anything particularly special. Their offense was barely in the top half of the league entering this week. And likewise, their defense was barely in the top half of the league entering this week as well. But thanks to the surprising, out-of-nowhere resurgence of 35-year-old quarterback Ed Brown, along with some talented pro bowlers on both sides of the ball, like Lou Michaels, Buddy Dial, and future Hall of Famer John Henry Johnson, the Steelers entered this week in second place. It's the biggest game of the season. It's arguably the biggest regular season game in NFL history at the time. And without any exaggeration, this was the biggest game in the history of the Pittsburgh Steelers. They had been around since 1933, and in their 30 years, they had never played in the NFL Championship before. They finished tied for first in the Eastern Division in 1947, alongside the Philadelphia Eagles. So they played a playoff game to get to the championship, which they lost 21-0. For all intents and purposes, this was a de facto playoff game. The winner represents the Eastern Conference in the championship, and the loser is eliminated, having to watch the title be crowned from their home. It's the 10-win Giants against the 7-win Steelers for the Eastern Conference title. And this was shaping up to be a battle for the ages, to determine support. Wait, wait a second, wait a second, hold, hold up. That can't be right. The 10-win Giants? This team right here. This absolutely dominant team right here. Against the 7-win Steelers. And it's a battle for first place? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, I wasn't telling the whole story, because the Steelers had a few ties to their name. So it's not like they were 7-6 and six through 13 weeks. Remember that back in 1963, there was no such thing as overtime for regular season games. Once the clock hit triple zeros, that was it. Meaning that it was incredibly common for teams to have at least one or two tied games in a season. Let's look at the standings and see if that tells us anything. Alright, the Giants were 10-3, and, and the Steelers were 7-3-3. Three three. That still doesn't seem to make any sense, though, when you think about it. Think of a tied game as half a win and a half a loss. If we do that, that gives the Steelers 8.5 wins and 4.5 losses. The Giants are 10-3. and three. If the Steelers win this game, they have 9.5 wins in 14 games and the Giants still have 10. The Giants' winning percentage with a loss at 10-4, and 4, under today's rules, would be 71.4%, while the Steelers' winning percentage with 8 wins, 3 losses, and 3 ties would be 67.9%. So something's not adding up at all. Shouldn't the Giants have the conference clinched and locked up right now? How are the Steelers still relevant? Well, that's because in 1963... 60 years ago, the rules were a bit different, and it led to absolutely insane and stupid scenarios like this one involving the Giants and the Steelers. Because you see, in 1963, tie games did not count in the standings. If a game ended in a tie, it was as though it never happened, and it was as though instead of playing 14 games, you just played one less game than everyone else. This meant that the 7-3-3 Pittsburgh Steelers, instead of having played 13 games entering the final week of the season, played 10 games. It was as though the number in the ties column was as relevant as the points on whose line is it anyway, where it just doesn't matter at all. It's completely made up. In other words, pretend entering this game that the Giants are 10-3 and, and the Steelers are 7-3. and three. But remember... We don't go based on how many games you won. We go based on your winning percentage. And if the Steelers won, they would be 8-3, having won 8 out of 11 games. Since again, the three tie games don't count, while the Giants would be 10-4. The 10-4 winning percentage stays the same, as the Giants would have won 71.4% of their games. But the Steelers, at 8-3, have a winning percentage of 72.7% which is one percentage point higher than New York's. And that's how the Pittsburgh Steelers, despite winning eight games and tying three and losing three, get the top spot over a team that won 10 games. You realize how absurd that is, right? You're telling me that tie games just don't count? 
They count for everything else. They count for the players and their stats, but they don't count for the standings? It's essentially the equivalent of telling the fan that bought tickets to the game and spent three hours watching the broadcast that the game never even happened. And the crazy part was that the NFL saw no problem with this whatsoever. Even though in theory, this could lead to a scenario where a team can go 1-0-13 and win the conference over a 13-1 team, the NFL was really fine with this. Usually, when something absurd like this happens, the NFL immediately tries to rectify the problem. We saw that in 1970, when after a coin flip nearly decided the wildcard spot in the NFC, due to a lack of foresight when it came to tiebreakers, the NFL immediately added a new system of tiebreakers for 1971 and beyond to make it so that a coin flip could never happen. You can learn more about that debacle by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But here, not only did the NFL have no problem with the system, which was a system that allowed this game right here, the Giants-Steelers game, to mean something. In fact, they embraced it. When Chicago Bears owner, coach, and just about everything else under the sun, George Hallis, was asked whether the NFL should count ties as half a game won and half a game lost, which was not a unique concept at all, seeing as conferences in the NCAA like the Big Ten did that, Hallis said, quite bluntly, no. We're satisfied with the way that ties work in our league. They can be a help or a detriment depending on a team's won and lost record. And Commissioner Pete Rozelle, in only the second stupidest decision he made during the end of the 1963 season, echoed those thoughts, saying, sure, ties don't count, but remember they work on the percentages indirectly. Wait a second, how does that make any sense? How can ties not count and be meaningful at the same time? I mean, I know how, but doesn't that seem like an insanely backward system then? Better yet, how was the average fan supposed to figure any of this out? If I'm a fan of any other league, I just look at whatever team has the most wins, and boom, that's the champion. But here, it's like I need a calculator. This seems like a bad hypothetical question meant to get people to trip up when you ask how a team with 10 wins finishes worse than a team with 8 wins. There's something so inherently unfair about this, and something so bizarre about two teams, the Browns and the Cardinals, each on nine wins and being mathematically eliminated, while the seven-win Steelers are not, even though all three of those teams are in the same conference. Giants co-owner Jack Mara took the high road when asked about this before the game, saying on the possibility of his Giants losing out on the conference title to the Steelers, Based on this dumb tiebreaker, I don't feel strongly about it. As long as the other fellows play under the same rules I do, that's all I ask. But even though there was enough spirited debate about the issue in the media that Pete Rozelle said that the system might be up for changing, saying, This method was set up 30 years ago, and it has never caused much interest until this season, nothing happened. In fact, it wasn't until 1972, nearly a decade later, that the NFL decided to change its policy and count ties as half a win and half a loss. This did nothing. Absolutely crazy. Now, the reason you might not have heard about this wackiness before this video was the fact that the Giants made this entirely irrelevant, as you can tell from these highlights. The Giants wound up winning the game rather convincingly, taking it by a final score of 33-17 and leading at 16-0 at one point in the first half, which was a three-possession game back then, since the two-point conversion did not exist in the NFL, although it did in the AFL. This game never fell particularly close, as the Giants were on the front foot the entire time, winning their third straight Eastern Conference title in the process, before losing two weeks later in the championship to the Chicago Bears. And this led the standings to look completely normal. The Giants finished in first at 11-3, the Browns in 2nd at 10-4, and four, the Cardinals in 3rd at 9-5, and five, and the Steelers in 4th at 7-4-3. and three. But even though we eventually got from point A to point B, we did it in about the weirdest, wackiest, and stupidest way possible. Because as Herm Edwards once famously said, you play to win the game. Because if you tie it, it doesn't count. Except when it does. Who knows at this point.
Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.